to the USGS Landslide Hazard Seminar. This meeting is organized by the Landslide Hazards Program and co-organized with contributions from Stephen Slaughter and Jamie Kostelnik. For those, of the, for those of you that are new to this meeting, you have the ability to submit questions via the chat window or to use the raise your hand feature in combination with your microphone and video camera. We're going to wait until the end of today's presentation uh, for taking questions and generally generating discussion. So in the meantime, please just do your best to make sure your microphone is muted and your video camera is off when you aren't intending to speak. It's my pleasure today to introduce today's speaker, Chris Mikey. Chris received his BS in geology from Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and his MS in geology at the University of Toledo. He's been at the North Dakota Geological Survey since 2015 and has experience in surface geologic mapping, landslide inventory mapping, and USA, UAS technology. He also has possesses a background in environmental consulting, coastal processes, and sequence stratigraphy. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, Matt, uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me to give this talk today. Uh, like you said, my name is Chris Mikey. I'm with the North Dakota Geological Survey. Uh, today, the title of my talk is North Dakota Landslide Mapping, a Complete Inventory and Mapping into the Future. Uh, today, I'll be talking briefly about the history of the survey, kind of how we came to be, uh, briefly kind of the geography of North Dakota and briefly also the geology of North Dakota. And then 90% of this talk will be what everyone's here for, and that's uh, landslides. Uh, thank you very much. So the North Dakota Geological Survey was uh, established uh, and created by the North Dakota legislature in 1895, which was just six years after statehood from 1889. Uh, so this is an uh, early photo uh, from one of our early geologists doing uh, field work on uh, horseback. So it's pretty cool, you know, geologic time speaking, uh, short amount of time going from doing field work on horseback and who knows what conditions to, you know, when it's a North Dakota winter, I'm sitting in my warm office looking at LIDAR on a computer. Uh, and uh, so with that, the early mission was uh, to provide for a thorough geological and natural history survey of the state with particular emphasis placed on the evaluation of mineral resources. So we have several responsibilities um, in our state uh, century code and law of what we have to do. I highlighted the most important ones in white in reference to kind of today's talk and what we do, but specifically number two. So we investigate, describe and interpret the geologic geologic setting of the state with a special reference to economic products, geologic hazard, hazards and energy resources of uh, the state's uh, geology. So with that, our mission is threefold to investigate and report on the geology of North Dakota, uh, emphasizing the state's energy resources and stressing applied research leading to economic benefits uh, or quality of life improvements for residents of the state, um, and then to provide public service and to collect and create and disseminate geologic and map related information. And then third, uh, to administer regulatory programs and act in an advisory capacity to other state, federal, and local uh, agencies. So here's uh, the state of North Dakota. So um, I hope you've been here, but uh, stats would show probably not a lot of you have been here. Uh, you know, when people do the visit 50 states and, you know, collect their little whatever reward at the end, commonly we're one of the last, if not the last state that people uh, come to. So, here, you know, we're way up in the north central part of the United States, Canada, right above us, and Montana to the west, South Dakota to the south, and Minnesota on the east. And the eastern boundary between North Dakota and Minnesota is the Red River, which um, has a lot of slumping issues. Uh, I'll see some of those uh, later today. Um, so the state capital of North Dakota is Bismarck, which is where the North Dakota Geological Survey is located, where I live. All that we also have an office up in grand forks which is where our core facility is uh, on the university of north dakota fargo uh, is the largest city in north dakota right here in the eastern part of the state minot uh, people may have heard the name famous for the pretty large air force base uh, there where the b-52s are uh, etc then here out in uh, western north dakota williston watford city dickinson this whole region is known to be the bakken oil field which many of you being geologists probably have 
heard of. And then uh, I-94 stretches from um, west to east from North Dakota. So I-94 is, uh, you know, right here in Beach, goes all the way over to Fargo. So I-94, and we'll look at that in this next slide. So this is a cross section of the uh, state of North Dakota with uh, looking at a uh, cross section of 94, actually. So this is where Beach, North Dakota would be that I mentioned uh, the Missouri River's right here, which Bismarck is located right on the Missouri River and Fargo out here uh, in the east. So we'll start from, I'm just gonna briefly describe some of the more well-known formations um, in the state, Red River Formation, uh, is a conventional oil and gas play uh, moving upward Bakken Three Forks formation and a well-known uh, oil play that started 15-ish years ago, still going strong uh, today. Uh, unconventional play uh, moving upward on the Indian Kara formation, which is a, uh, for us, a well-known uh, sandstone unit with high porosity and permeability. Uh, which makes it great for um, injecting salt wastewater and wastewater um, as part of the oil and gas uh, industry. So all the salt water brine that comes up from oil and gas gets re-injected into the Indian Kara. Moving up, we have Cretaceous shales, um, and these do make an appearance out in the eastern side of the state, and those shales do cause a lot of uh, stability. Uh, issues and then up here in the uh, orangish color uh, outcropping at the surface is the Fort Union group, um, which consists of sandstones, siltstones, lignites. Uh, those you know do present some uh, issues with stability, and that's more of the you see a lot of those are the outcrops out in the Badlands in western uh, North Dakota. So we'll quickly look. Here to Strat Column, I mentioned that Bakken formation, 359 million years old, uh, moving upward in the Hell Creek, which is pretty well known, uh, 65.5 million years old. Uh, also, North Dakota, uh, are, you know, maybe biased great geologically, but also uh, for paleontology crowd, there's uh, a whole array of dinosaur bones located throughout the state. Uh, at the survey, we have paleontologists on staff. They leave di lead dinosaur digs every summer. I mean, there's T-Rex just south of Bismarck. Yeah, Hadrosaur up in the northeast corner of the state, uh, Mosasaurs, um, there's Triceratops. And uh, also geologically, you can see uh, in outcrop the KT boundary down in the southwest corner of the state at uh, Mud Buttes. Uh, then moving upward, uh, looking in the Fort, Yo Fort Union group, uh, which uh, is where some of those slope stability problems are in the Badlands out in Western North Dakota. Those sediments are 55, 60 million years old. So with that, let's look at a generalized ND geology map. And this is more focused with um, a landslide perspective on it, I guess you could say. So in the state, uh, here we have the Missouri River. Uh, Coming up, Bismarck, right in this area, Missouri River Lake, there's a dam right here, then Lake Sakakawea uh, here. So you can see everything in the green is glacial sediment. So the river is more or less the dividing line for the glaciated versus the unglaciated. And these bat more badlands type rocks, I say, is these Paleogene Cretaceous rocks here in the yellow. So slope stability issues. Um, Big problem out west. Um, glacial sediment is relatively stable. You'll see that on the next map. Then some of these uh, Cretaceous shales um, that peak out um, can create big problems. And then as we moved eastward, we get into the Lake Agassiz, Glacial Lake Agassiz Basin, or plain, I should say, in a Lake Plain. And there's glacial lacustrine -like clays, which do cause um, some issues due to their swelling. Uh, nature. So with that, now what everyone's here to hear about landslide mapping here at the North Dakota Geological Survey. So you can see some of those trends I mentioned um, really appear on this map about how, um, you know, basically the Missouri River acts, you know, as a boundary between these unglaciated rocks versus uh, glaciated with, you know, some landslide issues along with some of these Cretaceous shales 
are uh, peeking out. Uh, then along the east, you know, um, a lot on the border in the Red River, but those are, you know, really small, more like bank failures along the Red River. So to date, we have mapped over 55,000 landslides at the North Dakota Geological Survey. And this is maybe a surprise to some people because most people that have traveled to North Dakota think it's relative, relatively flat. But uh, a lot of work has gone into this. But why do we do this? We do it to our goal is to protect uh, infrastructure, uh, and that being roads, uh, bridges, wind turbines, oil and gas activity. So you can see on this map in the light gray highlights where the oil field is and the dark gray um, where wind turbines are. So, you know, just making sure when they're building wind towers that they're on relatively stable areas or giving um, advice, working in an advisory role. Then you can see this, these dense amount of landslides out in Western North Dakota in the oil and gas field. When we talk about infrastructure um, out there, we're mainly looking, you know, where, where they're building or where they may want to build uh, a well pad or facility, but also um, gathering and transmission lines in terms of oil and gas pipelines. And there's around 20,000 miles of pipelines in the state of North Dakota with a high concentration of those being out west. And, you know, we want to, you know, be safe, protect the environment and make sure everyone knows where these landslides are. So that's why we're doing all this inventory mapping. So moving into, we've done our mapping in three phases. First, with phase one of our mapping, uh, this began back in 2003, um, just kind of classic inventory mapping um, using stereo imagery, primarily from the 50s and 60s. Sometimes other Im stereo imagery would be available. Um, historical aerial imagery, you know, some NAEP, uh, Early 2003, Google Earth wasn't super great yet, but started, you know, integrating Google Earth uh, as well. So you can see one of our geologists there, Levi Moxness, using looking down stereo pairs. So then we moved into uh, phase two landslide mapping. Uh, and this began in 2017, uh, still, you know, classic inventory mapping, but all of this, anything phase two was LIDAR based mapping. Um, and all this mapping was done on QL3 or QL2 uh, LIDAR. Um, then also when we're looking at this, we're supplementing with uh, aerial imagery, NAEP, stereo imagery as well. And um, our big ac accomplishment that we're proud of is now we have finished phase two for the entire state of North Dakota. So all 1,464 quadrangles within the state, the one to 24 Ks uh, have been mapped with a LIDAR base. So that's what we're, I mean, really proud of. So helps we have, you know, we have statewide LIDAR, but just to show, you know, how the increase in quality was over time. So, you know, back when the 10 meter national elevation data set came out is a big deal, which it's it's great for looking at big landforms, landslides, um, depending on scale, not so much. So you can just see the increase over time of, you know, going from 10 meter to one meter and just the resolution, how great that looks. So uh, improvements. So LIDAR acquisition has greatly improved our ability to identify and map slide areas, particularly in densely vegetated areas um, with a lot of trees. So this is an image uh, of the south branch of the Pemina River southwest of Valhalla, North Dakota. So this is up in the northeast corner of the state. So you can, there's not a whole lot to see on this traditional aerial image, you know, dense vegetation, uh, river. But, you know, when we go from this image to LIDAR, boom, game changer. You know, this LIDAR, you know, a lot of you, if I'm sure in this crowd do landslide mapping, so you know how great LIDAR has been over time. So you can see essentially up here, this is called the Pemina Gorge, essentially the whole gorge has failed, but then we will, oops, sorry, we will go in and, you know, still delineate specific landslides um, as well, but just LIDAR was huge. And here's an example from Western North Dakota, uh, you know, so Western North Dakota has different um, challenges it brings, you know, being the badlands is really old sediments. It can be really tough to at times to di differentiate between, you know, alluvium, colluvium, slope failures, et cetera. So th that can present its own challenges. And here's an example of LIDAR. It's some more older LIDAR. It's not super great, but you can still see, you know, how it can really help delineate some of these uh, features. 
LIDAR improvements. Here is an example in the state how much LIDAR improved our data output. So that phase one I described to you was, you know, just on the stereo pairs, uh, aerial imagery, et cetera, 31, 37 slides mapped. Then moved to phase two with that LIDAR base, 588 slides mapped. Game changer, just increased our quality immensely. Great product. So North Dakota, we're really lucky because we have statewide LIDAR uh, available. So now across the whole state, we have QL3 uh, available and QL2 in some areas. Now we have started on um, the second go around. So now we're getting, now we have overlapping LIDAR data sets and I will walk you through um, this. So this is everything that is coming around for the second pass for the second time. So we'll have duplicate LIDAR sets. So anything in green is completed. So this area now is all QL2 and we will, and that is all um, second pass duplicate LIDAR data now that we have available um, and can map with. Uh, the red is in the contracting process right now and the um, black striped here has um, been flown and now is in uh, post processing. So, I mean, fingers crossed, we're hoping hoping to have that sometime this spring, summer, who knows, maybe fall. But in all this, uh, all the credit for this, the steward of the data organizing goes to the North Dakota Department of Water Resources. So you can go there to see where all the data is. So they've kind of managed that and um, have been the steward of that. So now this moves us into uh, phase three of um, our LIDAR mapping. So now phase three, this began in 2021, uh, like before it's in, uh, inventory mapping uh, and then some. So this is all LIDAR based mapping using aerial imagery available, NAEP, et cetera, but now adding um, repeat coverage. So between coverages, we're looking on most areas between eight to 10 years gap between coverages. Um, so with this, we can calculate the difference um, between raster data sets um, and it allows us to see any uh, changes then in vertical uh, displacement. So the graphic here represents the second raster being subtracted from the first raster. Uh, this process allows for elevation change to be detected. So seeing the difference in that, that Z value. So this is a kind of what the data might come out looking like uh, right away. Uh, so we have a GIS specialist that's really good who uh, handles uh, all this data. And so this is a raw differential elevation raster of the Ostenbrock quadrangle. It's kind of a flat, stable farmland area. And this is illustrating the different vertical precision between 2008 QL3 LiDAR and 2018 QL2. Uh, LIDAR. So artifacts from the older flight lines are visible, but are typically within plus or minus a foot, as you can see on that scale. But, you know, our GIS specialist before, you know, he gives us the data is able uh, to filter some of that out. So we don't have to worry about that noise when geologists are making those interpretations on the data. So with that kind of what does this look like when a uh, geologist gets this? So this is a differential elevation raster overlaid on aerial imagery of the Pembina River, uh, southwest of Valhalla, North Dakota, up that northeast corner. So the elevation changes between 2008 and 2018 um, were caused, as you can see in here, by landslides and many other sources. So anything with a uh, black polygon around it would be a landslide. We have the Pembina River uh, here, and you can see anything elevation changes are uh, right here. So reds would be your uh, negative Z values or your erosion. Green would be, you know, your positive Z values or deposition, uh, et cetera. So it's not like we can just get this data and think like, oh, great. OK, let's go find our landslides. We also become expert uh, experts in aerial imagery interpretation. So, you know, you see, obviously, we do have some landslides that were active in this time, but we also had movement in gravel pits. We had anthropogenic influences. We had, you know, bulldoze trees, you know, trails being cut. Um, then there's headward erosion and draws. And a lot of this would be great. Like fluvial geomorphologists would love this because you can see, you know, the migration of this Pembina River um, 
in that 10 year time span, just how fantastic it is. So now I'll give uh, kind of an example of what um, phase three uh, might look like uh, when we're looking at stuff. And on here, so this actually was just given me today by a geologist, so I apologize that there's uh, no uh, scale bar on it. Um, but I'll uh, just go with it and it, you'll think it's pretty cool uh, uh, once you uh, see it. So this is actually a location uh, it's near uh, Valley City, North Dakota, but this is just QL3 LIDAR data. And then eight to 10 years later, QL2 LIDAR data. So you can see a new slide appeared here. So, okay, so now we can look at the LIDAR. Great, we know we have movement. movement. So now what's this difference raster tell us? So here's what the difference raster with noise shows. So this is great. We can see the um, new slide that occurred on the LIDAR. We can see, um, you know, the scar form, the erosion, and then the deposition below. And then we, um, our GIS guy can, uh, you know, filter out some of this noise. Then that's what we see here. Uh, so we can see, you know, we can see this nice old landslide, but then this new one that emerged here, and we can, you know, see that, that signal that was received uh, between the two raster sets to know um, that that area was active. And then our last uh, order of business is mapping it. So this is kind of how we would uh, map it. So this, you know, older landslide that was stable, you know, map as QLS. And then this newer one that was active, we would map as QLSA, uh, inferring active uh, landslide. So this is just kind of our, that's kind of what the work would look like that we'd be doing as we're, you know, looking in ArcGIS and interpreting all of this uh, data. So then the finished product. So we put out um, on our website, we put out a low resolution PDF, a high resolution PDF and shape files that are available to download. So like I just showed, you know, in this light pink, we would have those QLS, those older, more stable uh, landslides. And then, you know, anything that was active, we would denote with that QLSA that was active within that eight to 10 year time span, that time between uh, LIDAR data sets. So in this, this is our final product comes out as a, on our website as a 24K map, one to 24,000. Uh, once we complete 100K, we will assemble and put 100K out. And we also will do uh, specific county ones as well, using that data, because just some counties, it's really useful for them to have for their uh, hazard mitigation plans, you know, for government funding uh, and so on. So we present at one to 24K, but what are we actually mapping at? So this is actually a screenshot from my window in ArcGIS. So we present at one to 24,000, but we identify and map with way more precision. So, you know, on average, I'm looking down, you know, here at this LiDAR imagery at, you know, one to 2,500, um, sometimes more, sometimes less, but that's, you know, I just happened to look where I was and that was my screen grab, but why? Why so detailed? So we want to map map um, the landscape uh, as you know precise as possible, um, you know, due to pipelines, infrastructure, uh, et cetera. Because we'll we'll get reports coming in from you know consultants that want to put a pipeline in through, you know, all these townships, and then it's really easy for us to pull up our landslide files and you know double and triple check that. But just awesome quick reference that we know is very detailed map to a lidar base. So it just makes our workflow uh, really good. So our current uh, inventory uh, available. So I told you we have mapped the whole state of North Dakota at QL3 or QL2 in that phase two. So um, statewide data is available for phase two everywhere. And now we recently started that phase three. Uh, so keeping our GIS guide busy, getting these maps done. So phase three, um, this is as of, March 2023, so this is pretty up to date. So phase three um, in this area, and then we'll keep moving up in this area as that's where uh, you know the current um, LIDAR data is uh, available. So the most landslide prone area is out in Western North Dakota overall, but we don't have any secondary LIDAR out there yet. So to supplement uh, that, we've been using UAS technology. 
excuse me. And um, so we we have some sites that we go to specifically out west just to keep an eye on uh, for slope failure. So this is just a screenshot from our the iPad for our drone. So we can go to a site, depending on the size of the site, collect hundreds, maybe a few thousand uh, images of two dimensional images overlapping at 85 to 90 percent. And then we can use structure from motion techniques to create surface models. And um, if you don't know what structure from motion for motion is, it's a photogrammetric uh, range imaging technique for estimating uh, three dimensional stru structures from uh, two dimensional sequences um, that can be coupled with uh, local motion signals. So with that, we're going to go on a little um, road trip around North Dakota. I'm going to give some show some specific examples around the state, um, some from our phase three mapping and some from some UAS technology um, examples. So first, um, quickly stop in Fargo, North Dakota. So, you know, a lot of people that aren't, uh, you know, aware that you know, come through or pass through North Dakota or been to Fargo is our biggest city to think, how can there be landslides here? It's so dang flat. And if you've been to Fargo, this is what it looks like. So I don't I don't I don't blame you at all. So North Dakota has landslides like you've got to be kidding me. But right in Fargo, the Red River, there are some small landslides along the red and bank failures, um, et cetera. So we're going to go down just about 20 minutes south of Fargo to uh, Hickson, uh, North Dakota. So I was actually out with other geologists in uh, Hickson uh, this uh, past August. We were doing, um, we we're also, I wear a few different hats. We were working on a surface geology map. Um, we were working on completing the, the Hickson quadrangle. And when you're doing surface geology mapping, you're, you're driving every road, you're driving every section line. You wanna know that quad inside and out. Um, so we were driving, driving around and we happen to see this, see this slump right here with, you know, these, you know, signage showing danger. Um, and we're like, oh man, there's a landslide. So you can see uh, right here, this is the wild rice uh, river. And then, you know, see the slumping uh, road up here. You can see the slumping right here um, going on. So we are out here mapping surface geology and there's our now published surface geology map uh, to prove that we were doing surface geology. Uh, but then when I'm out in the field, I was like, holy cow, OK, it's August. I published a landslide map on this area in July. I'm like, I better have mapped this landslide. So I quickly I pulled up my phone, pulled up this PDF on my phone from our website. And I'm like, I hope I mapped it. I hope I mapped it. And sure enough, I. I did map it and this is what we were looking at right here, and I denoted part of it as being active um, within those uh, LIDAR. Uh, coverages. So kind of took a sigh of relief. Glad I glad I did my job job right. So what we're looking at here um, in the six and quad borders uh, borders Minnesota uh, over here. This is Minnesota. So this area here is the wild rice river seen here and then the Red River bordering Minnesota right here. So you can see I mean good amount of landslides, a lot of slope failures from the clays in that area and I'll get into the geologic geologic setting in that area shortly um, and then Minnesota you might wonder oh why isn't there any why aren't there more in the red um, because we just mapped the North Dakota side so there's probably a lot more of the same similar failures on the Minnesota side so what did this landslide here what did this look like in our phase three mapping so this is what it looked like on an aerial base and a LIDAR base. So you can see with those signals, uh, the reds and oranges, you know, where the net loss or erosion was uh, in it here. And, you know, pretty clear it was active and that slumping was occurring. And you might be curious, why is the river orange or red? It's because there was a drop in water level. So that signal created um, that uh, net loss or those red and orange co colors. So geologic setting um, out for this uh, area, um, this would be, I put the reds on here, it would be applicable to the red or the wild rice. Um, so out in here, there's glacial lacustrine sediments of the Chirac and Brenna formations. Uh, they're highly unstable near the banks uh, of the rivers. Uh, so 
especially when surface loads are applied. So uh, the clays here, they're smectic with these units and it lends themselves to uh, flow instability. Flow and instability. Um, there's been a lot of examples over the years um, that have been documented in this expert you know, work was done by Don Schwert at North Dakota State University, who's uh, now uh, emeritus. And so this process, these failures keep occurring and anthropogenic effects uh, do have an impact uh, on them. So now we're gonna move um, to westward to Valley City, North Dakota, uh, just down I-94 to the west of Fargo, uh, right there. Um, in this area, it's known to have, uh, as you can see, a lot of this pink in the area landslides. It has a Cretace the Cretaceous uh, Pier Shale, um, which is very prone to slope failure. And uh, this example is actually just made by one of our geologists a couple uh, weeks ago. So you can see this is actually just a simple uh, Google Maps grab, nothing fancy. So uh, here you have I-94. Um, you can see here this uh, large John Deere uh, tractor uh, facility uh, factory. And that next to it is this uh, shop right here, this building. So keep an eye on this shop and especially look at this back corner. So you can see they have a parking lot here and a nice road that goes around back to the shed, et cetera. But keep an eye, keep an eye on that back corner. Like boom. Wow. That's quite a quite a substantial failure. I mean, that is creep. Oops, sorry. That is creeping in so close to that back. I'm sure it's impacting the foundation. Um, but Wow, like we, pretty extraordinary for us to find that. So he he was looking at this on Google Earth and he's like, oh man, I gotta, I'm gonna look at the phase three data. Like, let's see if this was, you know, this had to have been active. Let's see how this works. So like I said before, keep an eye, keep an eye on the back corner of this building and boom, it was active. So it's just great to see, you know, us using this data and having, seeing it validated and, just incredible and so you can see i mean the precision you know with those pixels gets right up to that foundation or right up to that back corner of that building right there and then right here so he was just like wow that's incredible so we had a geologist map this area a number of years ago and he went back and looked at the data he looked at and this area showed you know no no signs of um or the back the slope back behind this building showed no signs of failure or slumping at that time but with the shale in this area, just never know. So cool, fun, fun example here um, in Valley City, you know, just a few weeks ago, had off the presses, he was starting to get in to map that area. Now we're gonna move up into the Northeast part of the state to Valhalla, North Dakota. Way up here, um, just South of Canada, uh, up here is the Niobrara uh, formation, uh, another Cretaceous uh, shale, very vulnerable to slope failure. Showed some examples up here earlier, but you know, North Dakota has very little vegetation except for a few places in the state, and this is one of them. So very, uh, very dense vegetation, Pembina River, uh, right through here, flowing trees, looks nice landscape. And then we'll compare, this would be like 2021 NAEP, versus QL2 LIDAR. So the resolution on the LIDAR is just absolutely incredible. And I showed an example of this before, basically the whole valley, the whole gorge, Pemina Gorge, it's called, here's failed. Uh, so, but then we, you know, we go on to delineate it more. So here in these pinks and purples, this would be some of our QL2, or sorry, not QL2, phase two uh, data where we mapped. And then here we'll bring in that difference raster to see the changes in the Z direction, uh, you know, positive or negative, you know, reds being those erosive surfaces and greens being more or the uh, positive or, you know, uh, deposition surfaces. So we can see definitely areas in here are active, but then we have to determine, okay, what is landslide driven? What are the other thing? What are the other effects going on? And you can see uh, river was definitely pretty active um, in channel migration over 
those 10 years as well. So then kind of what the final result looks like is, is this. So then we go in and in these pinks, we identify areas where uh, landslides uh, were active uh, and so on. So it's just basically taking everything from phase two a step further, looking at everything on QL2 LIDAR. So, you know, we can adjust some of those uh, polygons maybe that we previously did uh, as well. So also an uh, interesting fact, like we have paleontologists that work uh, in our office um, and they uh, uh, a road in the side of this valley uh, was failing. So they, you know, cutting more into the valley wall and moving uh, the road uh, inward, and you know, as they as they were doing that, they discovered uh, more fossils. So there's a lot of fossils up here, um, but there's definitely some really, really spectacular uh, Mosasaurus uh, fossils. So uh, these guys, these big guys, were swimming around up here uh, back in the day. So just a cool little tidbit about uh, Valhalla and how landslides have turned areas into dino digs that we do. So, uh, but then now we're gonna move past that. We're gonna move down to uh, Bismarck, North Dakota, where I live um, here in the South Central portion of the state where our office is. So back in December, uh, this occurred, the slide December 22nd of 2019. So our geologists went out to the scene right away, county engineers um, to look at and uh, evaluate. It. So this occurred on River Road, you know, with the name pretty close to Missouri River. Uh, in town, you can see uh, some houses right here and then numerous neighborhoods uh, up here. So this road actually does have a pretty, uh, a lot of traffic does go on this coming from kind of people that live a little further north up the river or out in the country take this. So this did have a impact on people's commutes, um, you know, within the area. So this you know, occurred on December 22nd. It was cleaned up by December 30th. Uh, estimates say it cost about a million bucks to clean up. Clean up. Um, so then um, this was in March 3rd of 2020, just a few months later, that same slide, uh, different scarp on it failed, um, not as major as before. So it closed down the road again. Uh, you can see they started putting up cement barricades, um, just if any small fail failures happen in the uh, future that they can keep the uh, road open. Um, there's some more putting up the barricades uh, there, and you can see all of, and then, you know, Bismarck uh, houses up here. So we responded to the scene and, you, you know, used our drone um, multiple days. So this, uh, to try and explain this, this was between December 23rd to March 5th. So this landslide failed on December 22nd and then again on March 3rd. So this is kind of, you know, after both failures. So this is showing when, you know, the landslide failed into the road um, just to allow to see how much was actually uh, cleaned, cleaned up on the site. You know, we could get some volumes and work with county engineers uh, on that. And then also gave because so this was these were the flight dates, so then it gave also more indications when there's some smaller failures. Um, December 24th, there's another small scarp failure up here, and March 4th, another uh, small scarp failure up there. So just nice to give um, some visual insights into the those failures that occurred. So with this, for the data that we had for the site, we had 2016 QL3 LiDAR, which it's good, but then shows, you know, on site that we use, we could use those structure from motion techniques uh, using image 2D images to make some of these 3D models. So we have the December 2019 uh, digital surface model and then the March, you know, after the cleanup, um, when they start building those barricades, the March 20th uh, digital surface model. So then what did this slope look like? So uh, the pre-collapse slope um, is based off green here, and that's based off the QL3. Uh, LIDAR in uh, then red, we have kind of uh, what the slope looked like that December 22nd uh, landslide. Then after we can see with the blue kind of what that remediated slope uh, looked like. And then this is more 
so what it looks like in present day, I can't exactly say that it's present day because there's probably four to five feet of snow on top of it right now. So this is what it looked like, um, you know, in a nice uh, summer day. Uh, but, you know, what could have caused this? Um, you know, still not entirely sure, but you can see kind of some of this alkali leaching out here. So groundwater could have had uh, an influence kind of lubricating uh, that slope uh, for uh, failure. So I mentioned like today, if we went out there, there'd be a ton of snow on it in North Dakota. So right now we're approaching record level snowfall uh, for the season. So in this next spring and summer in North Dakota, it's going to be really interesting to see uh, how much snowfall uh, that we have uh, within the state um, and how that affects landslides, slope stability, uh, et cetera, with all that water. Now we're moving out up more out west into the heart of the oil patch into Kildeer, North Dakota. So you can see definitely um, up in there, a lot of pink, a lot of pink up there, a lot of landslides. And Highway 22 is a uh, super important uh, highway uh, through the oil field for oil field traffic, et cetera. Uh, this portion of the highway has actually been previously moved due to slant landslide issues. So we're working with uh, our DOT and their um, materials research, their geotech lab, um, keeping an eye on these scarps um, out there and giving them anything uh, we uh, know. So we don't have duplicate LIDAR out here. Uh, so then we take our drone, utilize some of those structure for motion techniques. So this is an ortho image, you know, that we were able to mosaic together with our drone. It may look a little grainy, uh, but it's really not um, about two inch horizontal pixel resolution. So if you zoom in, it's as crisp as can be uh, in the same area here with that digital surface model. See some of those landslides here, here flow going down. So this is an example of kind of looking at difference in Z values between uh, two data sets, one in October 2019 and then one in uh, November of 2020 and looking at the difference in elevation. Uh, good to report, you know, the scarps uh, looked pretty, pretty good. Um, no real uh, issues or concerns uh, at the time. You know, we could see there's a little movement within the landslide, not much of a concern, but just keep zooming in. So this is just uh, this surface model difference and then basically with the transparency over uh, LIDAR and the or the surface model and the uh, aerial. So zoom in and you can just see how crisp and how how close we can get and how good that looks. Um, you know, no concerns here, but just more of interest for impressed by the uh, resolution. And then with that, we can create uh, 3D surface um, models to look at, um, you know, might not come across over PowerPoint with the latency super great, um, but works works good for us when talking to policymakers kind of about these landslides and um, approaching roadways and such. So I've talked a lot about um, the data and what we do. Now I'll get into how to download the data uh, if you'd like it, if you'd like it. Uh, so here, uh, there the title you just go to our website then in the left hand pane here are landslide maps click on that uh, then that bring up this screen so 24k 100k county right there so then i click 24k you can see it highlights the 24k on the side so it's, everything's pink because we have done everything uh, within the state for at least phase two but then you could also select you know, down here, landslides, uh, 100K or county. Um, so let's click, we'll click on a 24K map up there in that Pembina area. So you could um, download a low res or a high res PDF and download the associated um, shape files uh, with that. Um, bring it into ArcGIS, use them for whatever purpose you have. And then this is kind of what the final product PDF looks like for a phase three map, the whole thing. So uh, you can see QLS um, in the QLSA, the active areas in the dark pink um, with just the QLS and the light pink gives some stats on, you know, what's been mapped 
in the quad, uh, you know, how many square meters, the area, total number of landslides, uh, et cetera. So we also, you know, do have the 100Ks and the uh, county maps uh, available uh, as well. And then with that, uh, this has been an immense amount of work. Um, I, you know, could have done this with several others, but just to finish, um, why do we do this? Um, so phase three added a nice time element to our data to be like, hey, this has been recently active uh, versus phase two um, never added that kind of time component. Um, so, you know, with all these depositional kind of environments in the state where we're seeing landslides, you know, some can be looked at on a decadal scale and some you can't tell if it failed 100 years ago or maybe thousands of years um, out in the badlands. But that's kind of why we do um, what we do. Uh, like I said, an immense, immense amount of work has gone into this, and I couldn't, uh, we couldn't have done it uh, without our team of geologists, uh, Levi Moxness, Brad Anderson, uh, Benjamin York, um, and then especially huge shout out to our uh, main GIS guy, Naveen Tapa, who has been doing a lot of that phase three, uh, messing with data for us in the background and giving us good products to deal with, and then also just cartography, um, getting all these maps out. And then especially, the, I want to thank the North Dakota Department of Water Resources for uh, all the LIDAR data. None of this work could have been done with all that LIDAR data. So um, huge shout out to them. And uh, thank you everyone for coming today. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. And now you know that there's some uh, landslides out in North Dakota. So in this one, uh, this is in Western North Dakota and Billings County, uh, captured with our drone. So thank you very much.